Good morning, everybody. It's the 20th, 20th of June, 2023. And yes, I got a new hat. Yeah, in case you were asking. But uh, yeah, I'm, uh, this isn't really that far from where I live. I'm just walking around and looks like they're doing some street renovations here. I don't know. It's too early for lunch, so I don't know. There's only a couple guys working over there. Now they're interested in watching me, watching them. But we had some rain, and that's, uh, that is great. Had some actual real rain. It wasn't like pouring down, but we had some real rain, and that's, we haven't had that for a long, long time here, so that's good. Now they had it in other parts of Belarus, but it's, uh, Minsk for some reason was very, very, very dry lately. So, but we're here to talk about the news and not the weather, right? So, <clears throat> I was watching a, um, video earlier today of Annie Akay and uh, I'm grateful that she started uh, also mentioning about this uh, plot to overthrow the Belarusian government coming out of Poland and uh, she, she maybe said a few things I didn't say I don't remember oops I'm disturbing their bath here these pigeons go on get back get back in there <laughs> look at that Okay, well, this is some more street works over here. People probably cleaning up, you know, they have a lot of this in Belarus. And uh, it's not like, you know, eh, don't really want to say. It's not like the Belarusian people are, you know, everybody talks about how clean it is in Belarus, but it's not like everybody here is, is cleaner people than in other places. It's because the government has a lot of people cleaning up. And it's, uh, you got to think about the cost of that. It is, um, as far as the economy is concerned, it's a lot of socialism, especially in that way. You know, it's, it's hybrid. It's a hybrid economy, like most other places on planet Earth are. There is no such thing as a totally socialist or totally capitalist or totally communist or totally anything type of society. Everything is normally a, a, um, is a hybrid. And even the United States has a lot of socialism, in case you didn't already know that. So, but anyway, let's get back to this, this talk, uh, I don't know, a lot, a lot of stuff going on. There's some puddles here too. Let's see if I can get to some area that's a little bit quieter. Um, you may not hear this, but I can hear all the noise, you know, on here. I'd like to get to some quieter areas. Anyway, I'm not going to do that. I don't have really so much other news to talk about. I mostly want to talk about, you know, this overthrow and why would they do this? And uh, instead of me getting ahead of myself, I should get get to get to what I was really or do it do this in a in a the order that I was planning on saying. I don't know what this is. Some kind of. Uh, I, wonder if, I think there's a street there. I can run down that street. And hopefully, it's quieter. It's, it certainly is quieter on the weekends. Here I'm not even crossing at the crosswalk. So let's go down this alley and adventure. You can get an adventure of of the area, what things are like. Look at here's some old building. It's part of the. Uh, I'm sure it's part of that plant because it's not far from here where they make trucks and buses and things. So maybe this is some old part of it. They got netting all over it in case anybody walking by probably doesn't get hit by some brick falling out of it. I don't know. They either, in my opinion, should renovate it or tear it down because that's valuable property, I would guess, not being used. And here's some more of that if you can see in the background. It's like weeds growing up on top of the roof here. It's not like some... I don't know. I have no idea what it is. Let's get going here. Okay. One thing I want to say about as far as news, and it's not so much about the, this overthrow in Belarus, is that the Russians have been noticing that when they capture these Ukrainians, and uh, what's been consistently, consistently put out, and a lot of you that try to keep up on the news on what's going on in Ukraine and all that, you probably already know about this yourself, 
and I've been mentioning this and other people, and of course Scott Ritter has been of course alluding to this and so has um, Colonel McGregor, but these uh, Ukrainians that are getting captured, you know, a little bit, a little, a little bit of more information. You know, you are hearing like Scott Ritter talking about uh, that when anybody is listening to the radio chatter, uh, you know, in Ukraine, you know, these people in either Bakhmut or anybody, or Atimorsk, or, uh, whatever, anyway, the whole place, anywhere, anywhere where these battles are taking place in Ukraine and in the Donbass area, that the radio chatter is always in Polish. Not always, most always in English or in Polish. And some of these captured, captured soldiers are putting out that their leaders, the, their commanders are all Polish or American. Surprise, surprise. But then I've been saying from the very start, and I've known this long, long, long before the, uh, the conflict broke out, that there's Americans there, there's lots of Americans there. They've even had uh, reporters walking on the streets, you know, when they were having uh, these uh, uprisings in Ukraine, even way back in 2014. And then they approach somebody with guns, you know, soldiers walking through, and then they attempt to, uh, to interview them, but yet they're speaking English. They don't understand the reporter. They just said, get out of here, get away from me. And they're, they have American or British English that they're speaking. And this is way back. This is what, seven, eight years before the conflict started. What does that tell you people? What does that tell you on who's the one that uh, is responsible for kicking this whole thing off? <laughs> and uh, a lot of that is what I wanna talk about today. Very, very fascinating stuff. And it has not, uh, not so much to do with any particular events in the war, but it's just the, the flavor of, of, of how this is really going down. Now this should really, this should really open up your eyes in a lot of this stuff. I mean, I found a vacant lot here. Big vacant lot area. Looks like a great place to be walking and talking and doing a video here. <laughs> so, but let me get, get going more here. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm mixing some kind of news in, as, uh, in this as well. I just did a video and I just uploaded it last night. So this is going to be one hitting the airwaves right after another one I had already put up. So I hope... Uh, I hope that's not too distracting for anybody wanting to view anything, but uh, um, Christian Linder, who's the man in charge of the German economy, uh, the money, he said that, uh, like I mentioned, that Germany has no more money, and of course they still have money, yeah. but in other words, they're getting short and, uh, and getting nervous, of course, is what, was what he's actually saying. And it's uh, uh, just yesterday, now Jens Stoltenberg, he came out and said, NATO has no more weapons, you know, and he's one of the big hawks that are trying to push more weapons to Ukraine and all that. And of course, he's leaving very soon, I guess in September, and nobody's even sure on who's going to take his place. Uh, I sort of put my money on uh, Ursula von der Leyen. I don't know, because she was the Minister of Defense for Germany before this, you know, and then who's going to take her place? Don't be surprised if it's Annalena Baerbock, because <laughs> They're cut from the same cloth, as far as I'm concerned, those two. So, matter of fact, they just look different, but they're practically, it's like the same personality, you know? Well, Ursula von der Leyen is maybe a little bit smarter. She knows the difference between 180 degrees and, and uh, 360 degrees. <laughs> so, but uh, they're just talking about that they have really no weapons and that, you know, and it's very strange you have, you have, uh, who is it that makes the F-16s, uh, you know? When I'm, I was in Seattle, you know, we had Trident shipyards, they made submarines, and, and uh, a lot of the weapons are made around the Seattle area. You know, Seattle, Renton, and oh, some guy crapping over there. Jeez. Maybe I should show him over there, he's over. No, you can't see that far. Well, at least he chose a good place way out here, probably a homeless guy, probably gonna be coming and approaching me for money or some crap soon I, I but um anyway these uh who was it i don't know whoever makes the f-16 um i guess they're still making them i didn't think they were i thought they're just all doing f-22s and f-35s and all that sort of stuff but they're still making them and they're going to make some apparently at least they have plans to make them especially for ukraine and um they're talking about when this conflict ends that they're either going to be 
um, doing this in Ukraine. They're going to be making them in, in Ukraine or around Ukraine somewhere. So the, what does that tell you, too, what their plans are? This is, they want this to keep going for a long time. And of course, the major goal, of course, oh, some guy over there. I don't want to go over there either. Weird. It looks like it's all vacant. I don't know what the heck these guys are doing. They probably live here. They're probably homeless people and that's some put pieces of concrete and it's their home or something. I don't know. Really weird. I didn't think there was any homeless in Belarus. No, I don't think he's homeless. It looks like a couple guys. They're just, who knows what they're doing over there. Older guys, maybe, maybe my age. I'm an older guy. But anyway, um, yeah, making these weapons. So what their plans are, you know, that everything, it's like, uh, I don't know. You know, anything can come in between that, but as we heard on the Duran, which is very accurate, you have the State Department and then the Pentagon, and these people have a little bit different views, and the State Department run by neocons, you know, Victoria Newland and, and these sort of people. And uh, obviously, they have no brakes, they have no reverse gear. The escalation excavator keeps moving, and they try to get everybody on there, even if anything, anybody uh, that's in opposition to them, too. They want on the escalation excavator, they want it to be a, I don't know, as if there's no limits to money. They should listen to Christian Linder a little bit. This is really getting to be something, and I think sometime they're going to, when they're running out of money, then they're going to start to realize these are a bunch of idiots, you know. So... kind of noise over there. Sounds like gravel running down some metal. But anyway, Annie A.K., if you want to see her video, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, she titled it something like, um, uh, starting out, the, the beginning of the title was uh, uh, Hundreds of Belarusians Training in Poland to Overthrow Lukashenko. And uh, what I want to say about that is if if you remember, just within these past months, you heard Joe Biden, and you heard Victoria Nuland, and you heard elements from the government in Poland, you know, high-ranking generals, former generals, but yet still as advisors to the Polish government, saying that they are not going to give up, at least not yet, on regime change in Belarus. So, to me, the interesting question is, uh, even though I can tell you the answer too. So why do they say this about Belarus? Why do they say, why do they come out and admit, we want to overthrow Belarus? They come and admit that, but yet you all know that they want to overthrow the government in, in Russia as well, but they just don't want to come out and admit it, really. You have uh, Lindsey Graham, maybe being a little bit honest and, and saying he wants to kill Putin, but uh, some of the other ones, oh no, that's irresponsible, we wouldn't say that, we wouldn't do that. You know, but of course, you know they do, they want to do that too. And uh, which would be a stupid move because Putin is actually a moderate. Just think if they're going to get uh, uh, Dmitry Medvedev in, which is probably the likely successor for Poland. He's a lot more hawkish. <laughs> I mean, he's a success successor for, for Putin. He's a lot more hawkish than Putin is. And there are quite a few that are a lot, a lot more like that. But I'll tell you, couched in that attitude, that, that is the reason why they don't say that about Russia some old wood here, but they do about Belarus. They believe that the opinion in Belarus is that they can get the popular opinion to support a lot of people, to support this sort of attitude towards a overt overthrow of Belarus. And it would, in Russia, it would have to be covert because of the patriotism, the outright patriotism of people in Russia and somehow you know Belarus trying to very wisely by the way in my opinion trying to be sort of like a bridge between the East and the West but it uh, turned out that of course this was uh, this was trickery as well just like the Minsk agreements and uh, I'm sure that by now Lukashenko realizes uh, they have no respect whatsoever 
Здравствуйте. You guys can't see, but some guy hiding in the woods there. I don't know what the heck's going on. Maybe I better stick to the middle of this area. But they have no respect for the people of Belarus. They have no respect for the culture of Belarus. They don't even have any respect for the culture or the people of Ukraine, and everybody knows that. Where do I go? This is very noisy over here. It bothers me, and even though you may not be able to hear it so loud. Why is there no perfect place to vlog? I can go through the woods here, but there's guys in there, sitting there. I don't know what they're doing. They're having a smoke break, but from where? There's nothing down below there either. It's just a lot of uh, kind of a forest, semi-park forest area. Maybe I'll have to tackle it from a different direction here while I'm walking around. I don't have that much more to say, but there's like some gravel sliding down something, making some noise over there. It's not like uh, fingernails on a blackboard, but it's still uh, something you don't want to listen to. I'll go around this fence over here and whatever this building is and uh, head out over there, maybe. No, it's got a fence all the way around it. I'm trapped. I'm trapped to guys, guys over there on the field pooping, people smoking and doing whatever the heck they're doing over there, gravel on this end, a fence on this side. I'm trapped. <laughs> but don't worry, don't worry, I'll get out of this. The neocons think they're going to get out, but I don't think so. But anyway, all of this is about uh, how they're going to do regime change. How are they going to do this in Belarus? You know, I'll tell you what it really is. I can't, can I go through here? I'll tell you what, it's like civil war. What's this guy doing here? Stasvite. Where the heck am I? <laughs> Some shoes sitting there. But, you know, they would have to be, if it was Russia, they have to do this covertly. But in Belarus, they would do it overtly. And as a matter of fact, you know, that seems to be the plan, is they believe they have enough popular support amongst the, uh, the public in Belarus that they can do this. And when they do announce it openly, that they're going to garnish some people maybe to participate also in some sort of an overthrow. So what they're trying to do here is they're trying to get a, they're trying to start a civil war in Belarus. And I'm hoping the government realizes this. And uh, I even hope the people realize this, but the people in Belarus have to realize that they have been the victims of some <laughs> very sinister, PSYOP operation of, in, of information against the society of Belarus. Because I remember, and I even mentioned this, and I was talking about it before, I don't know if uh, Annie Ake has mentioned this, but Poland has been talking about how successful they have been with uh, using propaganda or information, you know, to, uh, against uh, people. Or anyway, using propaganda. But now I'm wondering, I, I don't know, I can't remember if they were saying that this was against the Polish people. Because I'm starting to think now that, that this was all against the Belarusian people. Because most of this stuff has been coordinated through Poland. Even though a lot of these people that the United States and the people that control them, you know, this has all been going through through Poland, but yet they have uh, enlisted these people from from the Baltic states as well. Very much so. Oh look, there's some people planting some flowers. I should be filming more of this in Belarus. They have 
they do a lot of care, you know, but it's, uh, it's very expensive. Lots of gardens and lots of cleaning needing to be done and everything. And, and like I said, the people are not any cleaner here than they are in most any other places, really. It's not like, say, in Oregon, where people, by law, are made to be clean. You get a thousand, I remember back in the old days, uh, a $1,000 fine if you are seen littering. I think Germany has some similar laws too, so Germany stays pretty clean in spite of not having so many people, you know, doing all this cleanup work. It's kind of a busy area here. Maybe I can sneak behind some buildings here. Get myself sidetracked on the subject that I was talking about. This looks like some kind of a courtyard. Just walk up this way. The lighting is bad, so it's going to be probably very grainy, what you're observing now. Oh, here's that one guy that I saw doing whatever he was doing. Last week? So it doesn't look like those were his shoes. I think I showed those. I hope you guys saw those. So let's head back in this other direction here. No, I wasn't trying to make this a very long video, but I, you know, just trying to rationalize, you know, my point of view on what's really going on here. And uh, these, uh, these people and their lust, their lust for regime change. You have to ask yourself, well, what's, What's the point? Why do they want to do this? You know, and it, it all comes down to money, resources, and hate. <laughs> diversification. No, not diversification. Maybe so. But Russians are never included in that. And I've, I've mentioned in the past in some of my videos, I should re reiterate on that again, you know, when I studied, I was studying mostly German history, but in doing so, I noticed, uh, a lot of German history is built around an animosity towards Slavic people. Not Russians, Slavic people, which includes Russians and Poles. And I guess mostly what they're probably referring to. <laughs> Cleaning the streets here. Mostly what they're referring to are the Northern Slavs, of course. You know, the Poles, the Belarusians, the Russians. And uh, when you get down towards the south, you know, you got the Serbians and the Bulgarians, which are the southern Slavs. And I don't know if, there's, if they differentiate and say western Slavs, eastern Slavs. I don't think they do. I think that's just mostly northern and, and southern. I didn't really study Slavic history or nothing like that. But I know that, say, for example, these institutions like, uh, like I always mentioned, the Marks, Nordmark and... Uh, and all that. That was all set up to keep Slavic peoples out of Europe. And I think maybe some of that fear uh, comes from the fact that the Mongols came through. The Mongols, of course, they easily took over Kiev and they ruled, they ruled from Kiev. And that's a lot of part of their history. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if the Europeans at that time equated Slavic people with Mongolian people. I don't really know. I don't even know why, why they, why they look at Slavic people in some light like that as maybe inferiors or something like that. And, and with that view, a lot of these people over here, such as in Belarus, it's just very strange. And I've seen some, like there was an, there's an Australian blogger. As a matter of fact, I tuned into a live stream from him a few days ago. And of course, at some time in the past, I remember quite a while ago, I think just before I was leaving the Caribbean, that he was talking about uh, and I have noticed it, a lot of people notice it, but maybe not in his words, because I've heard it in other different words, and Russians even talk about this, Russian uh, uh, thinkers. They talk about that the, the people, you know, and this is probably even more true, definitely more true now than in the past, that Belarusians, a lot of time, they have this, this, this inferiority complex. They feel that they're not as uh, as up to the task or whatever, or as good 
as Westerns, Western people, or maybe the things are better over there. And maybe that's why a lot of them want to go over there. And even to this day, which is very shocking to me, you know, a lot of them, they want to go to the West. Why would you come to Belarus? <laughs> and I, and my thoughts are, why in the heck do you want to go to the West? You know, I mean, unless you're some, I don't know, LGBT sort of a person or, or, or whatever. I don't know, but what's also been coming out, and this is undeniable too, a lot of these people, even these terrorists that went to Ukraine, uh, some of these Belarusians, I think like Lukashenko was mentioning that, there's like a hundred of them left, possibly, a lot of them are dead, dead from either fighting Russians or f from Ukrainians killing them, because a lot of them, they want to come back to Belarus. And uh, if they start making an action towards that, they get killed. They get killed by their lovely Ukrainian squads that are, well, I guess I, you should call them Banderites. Maybe, they, maybe these people don't even see themselves as Banderites. But their orders are to shoot and kill anybody that doesn't want to go fight and die for, for Ukraine. Terrible crap, you know. Look at a lot of these people, they get into this, into this problem and, I, and, I, and it's like you can't get out anymore. And uh, a lot of these people, probably in Poland, they want to come back. And a lot of them actually probably could come back. But they, don't, they want to come back on their own terms. They don't want to come back on the government's terms. So a lot of them are training to overthrow, to at least attempt to overthrow. And you, don't, you can't play like you don't think the government doesn't know about this. Obviously, this was put out in, I guess, the... I don't know if it was London Times or the British Times or some kind of a newspaper, and that's that's what I'm actually talking about, and that's what Annie Kay was also referencing. But but this has come out before, like I say, before it came out on that article. It's a very well known fact. You know, you might you might have a question. Well, you see how this works, as far as uh, say the United States and Great Britain and other countries training Ukrainians on Western weapons and then sending them to Ukraine. But, and, the Uni and Russia has not attacked these countries, even though they said they are definitely now, they're definitely a party to the conflict when they do this, you know, just supplying the weapons without even the training. But I wonder what the uh, policy is going to be when these people are trained and sent onto the soil of the Union State of Russia, Belarus. That's different than sending them to Ukraine. So it's like an attack from Poland and Ukraine into Belarus, but they're just using supposedly Belarusian peoples, soldiers, men. It is nevertheless an attack, it doesn't matter maybe these people have lost their right to be Belarusian because they, for one thing, they ran away. Another thing, they're willing to take up arms against Belarusian and Belarusian citizens, of course, serving in the military. So this is a whole new, com a whole new thing. Very curious on what's going to happen if this ever comes about. Very curious. How is this going to come about? What are they going to do? How long is their training going to be? Normally, it's uh, it's no longer than say six or seven months. And these are saboteurs. A lot of them. This uh, attack on this A50, this airplane, you know, in Minsk. You know, with these drones, they were conducted mostly by Belarusians, but through Ukraine, apparently at that time. Uh, that didn't sit very well with Lukashenko and the government here. And as I said, uh, some hours, <laughs> just, just, just bragging rights here, just a little bit of bragging rights. A couple hours after they made this attack on this airplane, I was shocked to see some airplane like that flying in the air. And it was this airplane. And it was just a few hours after they launched this drone attack. And again, like I said, I'm not gonna say where I saw it and when I saw it. But it was just a couple hours after this 
So they attacked this airplane and then they got it in the air and moved it just in case another attack would be happening. You know, and I'm not aiding the enemy by saying that. You know, if anything, the complete opposite, showing that if when they attack some assets that they're going to be, you know, moved out of the way right away after that. You know, I looked, I, I'm not even, I shouldn't say, I don't want to say, I don't want to give anything away here. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to try to sabotage anybody or anything, any government or country, you know. And uh, in saying all of this anyway, I'm just hoping that the Ukrainian people wake up and that the Belarusian people even wake up. That there are some, of course, that are going to be going along with this. A lot of them have been brainwashed into thinking that things are better in the West. And this has been happening for most of their lives. You know, watching these television shows and all of that. What a psy operation. What a psy op. This is all incredible. And most of these people that go over there to some other foreign country, eventually they want to come back to Belarus. The system is a lot different here. Pay is a lot less, but costs are much lower. Look at, like I'm telling you, you can have a nice apartment, good size apartment, good living space, everything. And then you can have, pay your electricity, your water, your heating, everything. Everything per month. And your costs per month, I mean, over the year, your costs average. I, I guess it depends on a little bit on how much electricity you use. And I'm even quoting like cable television and stuff, but it's like like 60 US dollars or less. And that includes everything, building maintenance, your entire costs, except for, of course, your food and all that, but your whole entire cost, not food, not clothing, but all of your living cost. And you can't get that anywhere in the West. So obviously, there's practically, practically no homeless in Belarus. Sure, there are some poor people and the pensions are quite low here. But if you know that in advance anyway, even somebody at my age, if I'm gonna be struggling, you know, in 15 years or so, you know, mostly that's my own fault. You see a lot of these older people they're selling things on the street, flowers. They grow flowers. They have, a lot of them have yards and things, and they're selling things to make, uh, make ends meet because the pensions are maybe a little bit too low here. Um, and you can't even discount the fact that they'll probably be raising pensions as Belarus uh, will expand now that the Chinese are coming here and they're going to be lot, doing a lot more production. Of course, the economy here is not growing at any pace close to that of Russia. You know, the Russian economy is really really booming right now they're starting to produce everything everything on their own and I'm hoping a lot more of that just spills over into Belarus of course some of it is coming here but I'm hoping a lot of it gets better a lot of people are scared of Belarus because the West has been telling them oh it's a dictatorship the tyranny there everybody is sad and all this kind of whatever they're saying and again that's what I'm saying that's the effectiveness of the not just Polish, but the Western propaganda and all that. And I, I urge you to at least watch many videos of people, you know, English speaking people, since you're an English speaking audience, of those that are living in Belarus and in Minsk. It's a little bit different, maybe out in the provinces, a little bit poorer and things like that. But if you look at the environment yourself and you can say, well, hey, I can make something out of that. You know, you can get some land, some land with an old shack, but of course, needs a lot of renovation but you can get something like that for 1000 US dollars I've seen it I've seen it with my own eyes and uh, I at one time saw some place and it was $500 for a piece of land little little land you know and of course you can still do some farming on it but I, I said $500 and I, I couldn't believe it I couldn't believe it but uh, I saw one large piece of land $1000 a house was there but it was the house was burned down so you have to get rid of that mess too somehow the place burned a lot of people you know in a lot of these countries um, maybe they're a little bit irresponsible sometimes with the uh, with fires in their house or whatever smoking maybe some people drinking I don't know doesn't mean that you're gonna be doing that if you're gonna buy some place like that so use your brain when you're watching any of these things here you know don't let all the West fool you and you look for some little minor things and then they blow it up into something really big that that really doesn't matter at all all a bunch of lies and things like that 
And I'm not saying everything is better here or nothing like that. So it's just a different way of life too. And you come here with some good capital, I'll tell you what, you'll be pretty well off. It's, it's, it's good here. It is, and the government, try to look at the reason for why government here does what they do and what their policies are. And you'll start to find out there's a huge difference between here and in the West. In the West, the politicians, they work for themselves and they work for the agenda. And over here, the politicians, they work for the country. They work for the country. You hear very little of them working for themselves. All leaders live in privilege. I've, I've met different leaders of different countries as well, believe it or not. And uh, I've met some higher up people. But all leaders, they all have some sort of privilege. But I'll tell you what, it's still not a great life. You can't just walk out on the streets anywhere. I tell you, I would much rather cherish freedom, being able to walk on the streets, you know, than having to be cooped up. And I don't care if I'm getting pampered and all that. I'd rather have my freedom. To me, that's more valuable. So, you know, there's a price that leaders have to pay. And, uh, you know, you see um, film footage of Assad, you know, bicycling down the street. I think I remember seeing the, the leader of Holland taking a bicycle to work. But trust me, like I said, I've worked, I've worked in this sort of a, uh, what do you say? I don't know. So it's not in that institution, but I've worked in in this capacity, and if I'm, for, I, you know, a lot of a lot of time I was driving VIPs and whatnot, and you look on this, look out your window, and people walking, just acting like people on the street. They're security people, and I know them, and and these people are very, 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 very deadly. I'll tell you what, they they don't make friends with anybody other than amongst themselves and you put a gun in their hand and you will see some things that 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 that, that you it would astound you you know from a much bigger distance than what you're trained at they can just pick up the gun and fire off 10 shots bam 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 and they can fit that all in the size of a quarter and it's like what because i've been on the range with a lot of these people and it's just it's just like it's like what you know <laughs> So I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there firing with these people. You know, there might be three or four of them on the side here. And then they tell you to start shooting and I'm going, bam, bam, bam. And my shot group is, is much bigger than even a softball. You know, maybe it's the size of a bat, well, not the size of a basketball, but much bigger. And these people, they can fit all of their shots, you know, in rapid fire, all within the size of a quarter. And I said, boy, oh boy, oh boy, I'm not gonna wanna get in any kind of a gunfight with these guys. So anyway, I'm just telling you how some of these people, you know, you don't want to mess with them. And, uh, and they're all over on the streets when leaders and things are bicycling down the streets and all that. And of course, they scoped the place out earlier. When I remember, um, I think it was not George Bush or what it seems like. Yeah, George Bush's father, the George Bush number one, you know, when he came in to visit us and then Ronald Reagan too. I, I, I came in at the time of Ronald Reagan and like I said, I... I sat next to Ronald Reagan eating a, a dinner <laughs> and they had security all over there. He comes with a lot of, he came with a lot of security and they shut down the entire German Autobahn whenever they're going anywhere, a lot of these leaders. And I, I remember like George Bush and all that and, and they got so many people scoping everything out for a day or two in advance to make sure that there's nobody going to be up on windows and people are not allowed to be looking even out of their windows or anything like that. So when they drive by even on a street in a car with security around them. So anyway, that's how that's, I don't know, sorry I went off on a tangent there, but that's how things are, you know. Uh, like all these leaders, they get, they're well protected. Uh, food, their food only comes mostly from one source and when they don't, you know, apparently maybe Hugo Chavez, he didn't. And uh, you know, there's others. So, and you cannot give them like a avocado or anything like that. I already know that by experience. So. Okay, well anyway, that's about all I have to say. And make sure you subscribe if you haven't subscribed. This, this video may not reach any other people than my subscribers. I'm, I'm noticing that that's how YouTube operates, but just in case it does, or maybe you have to send it to somebody. Send it to somebody on Facebook or Buttbook. I don't, I don't have any of these sort of accounts, never did. So anyway, then, you know, increase my viewership a little bit. And I'm hoping I'm not on any kill lists of anybody. So anyway, until the next time, thanks for joining me and I'll see you then. Bye-bye.